All right, folks, let's talk about what we need to study for our unit test on evolution and natural selection. In your VIP section, we have two foldables, this first one, which was an introduction to evolution and adaptations, and the second one that shows the four steps of the theory of natural selection, as well as biographical information about Charles Darwin. In your labs and projects section, you have your evolution introductory web class, Penguin Lab 1, Penguin Lab 2, which hopefully you've turned in for a summative grade, your March of the Penguins note sheet, and our review lab gizmo activity, which was on how rainfall affects the size of bird beaks and how the bird beaks adapt to the fall of rain. You also have your evolution open note quiz, which is really just the preparation steps to your natural selection cartoon. And as always, you have your unit portfolio paper on evolution and your glossary for evolution. If you log on to Phoenix and go to the class website for this class, you can find full copies of notes as well as blank copies of anything that you might have missed under the tab homework and what I need to study. I also have review games posted in the review game section and you can find links to this and other helpful videos under the link Miss E's videos. Humans have always been curious. Long before anyone necessarily used the term scientist or called what they were doing science, humans have wondered about their world. Anytime you've been curious about the world around you, you've been a scientist. Humans wondered about how plants and animals and fungi and protists and bacteria and archaea came to be. Predominant theories in the past tended to hinge a lot on folklore and religion, but there were some people who were curious for other answers. One scientist with early theories about evolution or how species came to change over time was a scientist named Lamarck. Lamarck believed that changes in species occurred because of acquired traits or things that happened because of the experiences in an organism's life. A famous example of what Lamarck believed is in the case of giraffes. Lamarck said that as long as giraffes could reach plenty of food, their necks would stay short. But if for some reason the food was harder to reach and higher up, the giraffes would be motivated by an internal desire to get food and would extend their necks longer. The giraffes that were able to stretch their necks would then pass these long neck traits onto their offspring. That is, the ones that were able to stretch their necks the farthest would pass on these traits. Years later, another scientist came on the scene who disagreed with what Lamarck said. His name was Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin believed that new species arose in a different way, through inherited traits. His example using giraffes would say, that some giraffes had short necks and some giraffes had long necks, but the ones that were best suited for their environment, or the ones with longer necks that could reach more food, were more likely to successfully reproduce and pass their traits on to their offspring. Internal desire had nothing to do with it. Charles Darwin was not always a scientist. He started out his life wanting to be a doctor and then a priest, and then eventually settled on the science route when he signed up for a round the world voyage on the HMS Beagle. Darwin traveled many places, but perhaps the most famous place he visited were the Galapagos Islands, right off the coast of Ecuador. While in the Galapagos, Darwin observed a variety of unusual organisms. Perhaps most famous among the organisms he observed were the tortoises and the finches that he saw on all of the islands. Darwin noticed that the tortoises and the finches on all of the different islands had interesting differences between them that allowed them to really live well in their environment. Some of the tortoises had arched shells and had very long necks. They could reach food far from the ground. Other tortoises had rounder shells and couldn't lift their heads up as high. Darwin also noticed that all of the different finches had different beak shapes, almost as if they were perfectly suited to the kinds of foods that they ate. Finches that ate primarily seeds and nuts had larger beaks that were better for crushing. Those with sharper beaks tended to eat insects. Darwin pondered what he observed on the Galapagos Islands and added it to what he already knew about fossils and economics, as well as selective breeding. One of Darwin's favorite topics to read about while he was on his voyage on the HMS Beagle was the topic of fossils. Fossils, or the petrified remains of once living organisms, fascinated Darwin, and studying fossils was a relatively new science. It suggested that the Earth was much older than people previously believed, and that life existed on it before humans. Darwin also took into account theories of economy, such as those of Thomas Robert Malthus, who suggested that over time, a population could only increase to a certain point before it ran out of resources. 
It is said that Malthus gave Charles Darwin the idea of survival of the fittest. Darwin also knew a fair amount about selective breeding, which was a common practice of farmers to get crops and livestock with desirable traits. We've talked a lot before about how people use selective breeding to turn wolf pups eventually into the domesticated dog. All of these concepts solidified in Darwin's mind as he was coming up with his theory of natural selection. In 1859, Darwin published all of these ideas in a book called On the Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. You may hear it referred to as The Origin of the Species. It's the same book, it's just got a really long title. To give you a frame of reference, this book was published at the same time that Mendel was pollinating different peas in his garden. Darwin's theory went a little something like this. Although he didn't know about the structure of DNA, he had this concept that there was some kind of material inside of cells that was passed on from generation to generation. He proposed that sometimes changes, we know them today as mutations, occurred in this molecule. These changes might be positive, negative, or neutral, having no effect. Supposing that these changes were positive, or beneficial, they would help an organism survive in their environment. Positive changes would lead to an adaptation. An adaptation is any function, structure, or behavior that helps an organism better survive in its environment. As organisms progress through the steps of natural selection, more on that later, as they struggle to survive, their adaptations, if they were positive and helpful, would make survival much easier. If enough time passed, this would lead to evolution or accumulated changes in a species over time. Depending on how many changes occurred and how long this went on, this might even result in a new species. The first step in Darwin's theory of natural selection is called overproduction. Overproduction states that more offspring will be born than will survive to reproductive age themselves. In our example, let's say that there are two frogs that have a bunch of eggs. Not all of these eggs will hatch, not all of the hatched tadpoles will turn into frogs, and not all of those frogs will lay eggs of their own. Thus, there's overproduction. More eggs or offspring than will grow up to be reproductively capable adults. The next step in the theory of natural selection is genetic variation. As these eggs hatch and turn into tadpoles, there will be a great deal of variety between these organisms. You can see that in this population of tadpoles, no two tadpoles look exactly alike. And although there are lots of tadpoles here, we started out with more eggs. These tadpoles all have genetic differences that may help them or harm them or be neutral differences. If they have positive genetic differences, this could lead to an adaptation and make survival easier. If they have negative genetic differences, this will make it a lot harder for them to survive. For example, some of the ones that have coloration that make them stand out a little bit more from the crowd might be more likely to get eaten by predators. However, most of these genetic differences or variations will be neutral and will have no effect. Our third step in Darwin's theory of natural selection is the struggle to survive, also called competition for resources. As we stated before, some of these differences will be helpful or harmful or neutral. Let's imagine that not being able to blend in with plant life would be a harmful difference. All of the organisms that seem to stand out a little bit too much from the crowd will probably get eaten before they can reach adulthood. Now let's imagine that there's a drought and some of these tadpoles are in an area that dries up. They're also not going to make it to adulthood. They also have to contend with diseases and compete for limited resources such as food, water, air, and living space. Let's say when all is said and done, only these tadpoles grow into adult frogs. Our adult frogs also have these genetic differences that will help them, harm them, or be neutral as they struggle to survive. Let's assume again that the ones that stick out a little bit too much are more easily captured by predators. And a couple might get some diseases or be old, and others still might suffer the results of natural disasters. This leaves us with just a few that reached adulthood. Remember, we started out with so many in the first step, overproduction. Now comes the last step successful reproduction. Assuming that these frogs are able, they will hopefully reproduce and pass on their traits to the next generation. The assumption here is that those frogs that were able to survive to adulthood have the strongest traits or the traits that are best suited to this environment and thus will pass their traits on to the next generation. Once again, we will go through the steps of overproduction, 
genetic variation, the struggle to survive, and successful reproduction. Once again, we see a cycle between these steps. A key part of this theory is to understand that it's natural selection. That is, nature is the aspect that's determining or selecting which traits are favorable. It's up to the environment to determine which mutations in all of this genetic variation are positive and thus are adaptations. The environment or context is key. Let's look at a real life example. We'll look at some foxes. Arctic foxes that live up north where it is very cold have several helpful adaptations. They have thick white fur to help trap their body heat. And they also have very small ears so that they lose only a small amount of this body heat. Fennec foxes, on the other hand, live in deserts very close to the equator. It's much hotter there. In this environment, having an adaptation such as thick fur would actually be a negative thing to have. Finnick foxes have very thin fur that is very similar in color to the sandy environments in which they live. They also have massive ears that help dissipate their body heat. Finnick foxes live where it's very hot and Arctic foxes live where it's very cold. They are both best adapted to these environments. Were we to switch their environments, they would both surely die. The Arctic fox that is adapted to a cold environment would hold on to too much body heat and die. The Finnick fox that's adapted to a hot environment would lose too much body heat and die. Adaptations for the environment can be structural or behavioral. Structural adaptations have to do with body structure or body parts such as the ample layer of blubber or insulating body fat in the Weddell seal, the world's most southerly mammal. Behavioral adaptations are actions that an organism takes to help it survive. For example, we discussed the way that emperor penguins huddle together when it's cold. They also go on a miles long journey so that they can lay their eggs in a safe place. Because these are behaviors or actions, they're called behavioral adaptations. If a genetic variation or a trait is negative or less helpful, we would expect to see it less and less in a population. Such is the case for vestigial structures, such as human wisdom teeth or the tailbone, tonsils, or the appendix. These are structures that might have been helpful in the past, but are no longer really that useful to us in the present day. In fact, a lot of these things can hurt you more than they can help you. If you have infected tonsils or a burst appendix, you can get really sick depending on the situation. So while this all might make sense to us today, it was not very well received in Darwin's time. People were very upset because what Darwin was suggesting went against what they believed. Their beliefs said that the earth was much younger than what Darwin was suggesting. They were upset at Darwin's suggestions that the earth had changed because it was different from what they believed. Today, however, Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection are what scientists take as the truth. Until this theory is proven incorrect, it is believed to be true. There is a great deal of evidence to support Darwin's theories, which is why scientists are eager to accept it as the truth. We've already spoken a little bit about fossil or the petrified remains of once living organisms. If an organism has gone extinct, that means it no longer has any living members of its species. Fossils suggest that there were many other species of all kinds of life on Earth other than what exists today. When we examine these fossils in the context of the fossil record, we get a relative date or age of the fossils. The fossil record works a lot like trash in a trash can. The oldest stuff is at the bottom and the newer stuff is at the top. If we imagine that this is our rock layer and we find this fossil and then this fossil and then this fossil and this fossil, this would suggest that the bottom fossil is the oldest. It would also suggest that the next species to come on the scene would be this one. Because the flower and the penguin are fossilized at the same time, it suggests that they were on earth existing at the same time. Once again, the lower something is in the fossil record or the layer of rock on earth, the older it is. We can also find evidence for the theory of natural selection in homologous structures. Homologous structures are structures that are similar in different species. Although they might not be used for the same purpose, they have similar structures. A frog, a fish, a fox, and a seal all have front limbs. They use these limbs for different things. Some for jumping, some for swimming, some for digging. 
The bones in these limbs are similar in structure, suggesting a common ancestor. However, it might be a long way back before these organisms are actually related. Were we to draw a family tree, we would probably see something like this. That somewhere back in history, there's a common ancestor that differentiated itself into other ancestor species that led to fish, frogs, foxes, and seals. The closer these lines are on this family tree, the closer related these organisms are. Although this one is very rudimentary, it suggests that these foxes and these seals are more closely related than perhaps the seal and the fish. We know this is true because both of these organisms are mammals. Other structures that provide support for natural selection are the vestigial structures we talked about before. The fact that these are no longer useful today, but were perhaps useful at another time, suggests that evolution is occurring, even today. But perhaps the most compelling evidence for natural selection and evolution is that of DNA. No matter how old or young, big or small these organisms are on Earth, all life on Earth has DNA that is made up of these four base pairs. These commonalities suggest that life has existed on Earth for a long time and that this life is constantly changing. I want to take a moment to clear up some common misconceptions about Darwin's theory of natural selection. The first one, the one that got him in a lot of trouble with his peers back in the day, is the misconception that he was saying that humans are descended from apes. That's not what Darwin was saying. Darwin was simply saying that if you go back far enough in evolutionary history, humans and apes shared common ancestors. Another misconception is that analogous structures are the same thing as homologous structures. We said that homologous structures are similar in form but different in function. Analogous structures are much more closely related in function. For example, both fish and penguins swim. However, they are only distantly related if we look at evolutionary history. Penguins are birds and this fish is a fish. Although they both spend most of their life in the water and swim as their primary means of transportation, they are not as closely related. The flipper-like wings of the penguin and the fins of an angelfish are similar in purpose, but different in evolutionary history. Another big misconception is the meaning of this word fittest in the phrase survival of the fittest or strong in the case of only the strong survive. If we go back to our population of frogs, this time I'm gonna throw in a few that might not have the best adaptations for the particular environment. The frogs that are the fittest for their environment are simply the ones that survive the best. Like we said in our earlier example, the ones that don't stick out as much in their coloration, the ones that blend in a little bit better to their surroundings are probably gonna pass on their traits. They're the fittest because they fit the best in their environment. Fitness in this case has nothing to do with exercise. Similarly, in this phrase, only the strong survive, only the traits that are strong or good in that particular environment will be passed on to the next generation. Fitness and strength in this case have less to do with lifting weights or exercise and so much more to do with having happen to inherit traits that happen to help you in certain situations to compete for resources and survive to see another day. Darwin's theory could very succinctly be summed up as change or die. Species can either readily adapt to their environment or they die. Now's the part where I'm gonna review everything. Really, really fast. Positive mutations or positive changes in DNA can lead to adaptation. When an organism is dealing with natural selection, contending with its environment, struggling to survive and struggling to get enough resources, the adaptations will make survival easier. The organisms that are able to survive will pass on their traits. The four steps of natural selection are as follows. Overproduction, where more babies are born than will grow to adulthood. Genetic variation, all of those offspring that are born have slight differences that will help them in the step three, struggle to survive. And the ones that survive the best go on to step four, which is successful reproduction. And then the whole thing begins again. Sometimes this theory is succinctly described as survival of the fittest. But we know that in this case, fitness has nothing to do with working out and everything to do with having happened to inherit helpful traits.